you doing? Um, my name's Martin. Um, if you want to know who I am, you can scan that and you'll find me online uh, doing what I do. Um, I'm actually talking today, yes, what Anne-Marie said, I'm going to talk about my experiences and I'm going to talk about hopefully some of my experiences will resonate with some of your experiences and if they don't, tough luck. Um, but I hope that some of my experiences are going to resonate with yours. I'm also going to try to link it to the idea of the four pillars of education, which are very, very important. They are, if you didn't know, they're to know, to do, to live together, and to be. And we're going to explore what these might mean. But before we do that, I'm delighted to see that everybody on your table, you have a piece of paper and a pen. Does anybody not have a piece of paper or a pen? Perfect. Is it, oh, somebody does. No, you've all got a piece of paper and a pen. That's absolutely brilliant. What I'd like you to do is have a look at this. This is an incomplete picture, okay? So I've just put an incomplete picture on the screen. What I'd like you to do, very, very quickly, draw it on your piece of paper and complete it. I'm not going to give you too long. It's not a big thing. You don't have to be a great artist, but draw that picture and complete it. Thank you. Right. You don't have to take too long over this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through, first of all, the idea of to know. Now, I don't know how many people have ever been to school, but school to me was one of the most revolting exercises I've ever done. Um, I've got a PhD, by the way. I've got a doctorate in philosophy. Um, but I wouldn't have if it had all been done to school. School was awful. Absolutely awful. And there are reasons that school is awful. And I'm going to give you a history lesson. You probably didn't realize you were coming for a history lesson. But I thought I'd give you a history lesson. So I've called this the history of being clever and why it matters for dyslexics. So although we crawled out of the swamps and climbed down from the trees roughly 7 million years ago, it wasn't until the Swedish father of modern biology gave us the name Homo sapiens in, 19, in 1758 that we began to classify ourselves in the way we do now. So the word Homo sapiens, you've all heard it, but the word Homo sapiens only came, to, only came to exist in 1758. This is kind of important. The next thing, and this is really important actually, the Industrial Revolution is a term used by historians to describe a process that spread from Northern England to the far reaches of the world and whose effects can still be seen for good and for bad today. The period of the Industrial Revolution is generally considered to have begun in 1760 and come to a conclusion in 1840. So we got this name Homo sapiens in 1758. The Industrial Revolution began in 1760. It's going to come obvious why I'm telling you this in a second. Englishman Charles Babbage first thought of the idea of computing logarithms by machine in 1812. The 1820s saw him design his difference machine, but cost and technology meant that it wasn't built. He designed his more complex analytical engine in 1837, but similar problems with cost and technology means he never saw it built. Next. It's not going to go on forever. Though. Although the word science had been around, uh, in one usually classically Greek form or another, since, or another since at least the time of Aristotle, it didn't take on its current usage. This is really interesting. The word science didn't take on its current usage until William Crewell, however you pronounce that name, coined the term scientist in 1833. Before 1833, people would talk about what we now think of as science, they talk natural philosophy. And this is really interesting because science is about objectification. It's about classification, it's about control. Natural philosophy was far more about com communing with nature. But it wasn't until about 1833 that we got this term, science and scientist. And what's commonly referred to as the British Empire, or the Second British Empire, began in 1783 with the end of the American War of Independence and the realization that political control was not necessary for economic success. This is a political move from a traditional imperialism towards an early globalized capitalism. The company most responsible for this, the East India Company, which controlled half of the world's trade in the early 1800s, was dissolved in 1858. The modern education system is usually credited to American Horace Mann who became Secretary of Education in Massachusetts in 1837. School would be uniformly organized according to a basic curriculum with professionalized teachers. Before that, it was all Jesuits, basically. The term factory schools came into use in the 20th century to describe a possibly similar system in Prussia at the same time. 
In other words, in other words, what you might think of as the modern scientist, scientific age began in 1758. And basically, the, 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 the beginnings of science went from 1758 to 1840. It was 82 years from the time when we self-identified as being sort of homo sapiens, rational humans, to the beginnings of teaching how to think rationally, the beginnings of modern education. It was less than 100 years, a tiny pocket of history. Now, this is important because what happens is, in this period, this gave us our entire conception of what education is. This tiny pocket of history gave us, a gave us our understanding, even today, of what education is. Knowledge is built on education. And this is built on and according to the needs of empire and industry, which is predicated on one particular type of rationality, which is built on a self-conception of who we are, homo sapiens, <coughs> different, more evolved, sort of different from the rest of the world. And what you notice is that this means that education is, by necessity, rigid, exclusive, flawed, purposeful, that is for the purpose of the Industrial Revolution, imperial, imperialistic, including racist, by the way, capitalist, historically contingent, and divisive. This is what education is because of the needs of the people who created the education system. And we put this into schools. This is what we do. We make schools built on all of this. And we don't have to. And it makes you ask, what, which do we want? Here, from an, uh, a website called Creating Calm, um, neuroscience and play. Play is an emotionally engaging experience that increases the levels of oxytocin in the brain, supporting emotional health and connection. By creating and supporting a playful environment, uh, the child is able to relax so they can go more deeply into therapeutic and learning process. Play allows the child to have a whole brain experience, integrating creative and emotional right brain functions with left brain logical analytical functions. Scientists have recently determined that it takes approximately 400 repetitions to create new synapses in the brain. That is learning. Unless it's done with play, in which case it takes between 10 and 20 repetitions. In other words, play is better for learning than the traditional education system that we have. And then I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on. Mirror neurons in the brain allow for shared understanding between the child and the therapist and co-regulation for the child as they manage big feelings. We can have this or we can have this, which is generally what our education looks like. More rigid, less friendly, less playful. So, you all have in front of you a piece of paper with this on it. Okay? I ask you to complete this drawing. I want you to show it to the person next to you. Does it look a little bit like this? Or does it look a little bit more like this? Which one does it more closely resemble? are creative geniuses. The vast majority. I'm going to show you some studies to prove this. Um, they, again, a guy called LaFrance, they took three groups of students. Gifted students who were not dyslexic, gifted students who were dyslexic, 
and non-gifted students who are dyslexic. And they gave them the test that I gave you. It's called the Torres Test of Creative Thinking. It wasn't just something random. It's a proper psychological test. The Torres Test of Creative Thinking. And they found that which group do you think performed the worst? The non-dyslexics. The gifted non-dyslexics performed worse than the non-gifted dyslexics at this creativity test. Very, very common. It happens again and again. A woman called Cancer, I hate that name, but a woman called Cancer showed that there is an inverse correlation between your ability to sort of do literacy stuff and your ability to do creativity stuff. Again and again and again. So the more, the more literate you are, the less creative you are. The more dyslexic you are, the more creative you are. There's a load of, I just put these together because there's about five of them. Different studies show that students with dyslexia scored low on, low on verbal memory and reading, but really high on visual memory and originality tests. In other words, dyslexics are more original than non-dyslexic. Further on, you know, more, more creative, more visual, more intuitive. Here's a quick question. Here are four, four images. Which of these two images are possible physically and which are impossible? Physically. Any ideas? Top left. The top left is possible. possible. Okay. Anyone else? Top right. Top right is possible. Possible. Absolutely. The two top ones are possible. The two bottom ones are impossible. Now, what's really interesting is dyslexics see this faster than non-dyslexics. Dyslexics have an ability to see the possible and to see the impossible in images. It's really fascinating stuff. It's also fascinating that we've got we, because I'm dyslexic, by the way. I had the worst time at school. I, had a, I failed everything. But we have this ability to generate new ideas. We have this ability to put new ideas together. We have this ability to see things that other people can't see. And by the way, score high on interpersonal scores, like kindness, like honesty, like good judgment, like leadership. Dyslexics score higher on all these matrix matrices than non-dyslexics. And this is something they don't test at school, because school isn't there to test that. School is rigid. School is built upon the needs of the Industrial Revolution, which are way gone. We are way past the Industrial Revolution. And by the way, this is a really interesting one. Is anyone in this room dyslexic? Or do you know anyone who's dyslexic? Brilliant. What you may find, what you may find, this is fascinating. Dyslexics feel emotions more. They, again, they, what we call Storm or Storm or whatever her name is, however you pronounce it, they wired loads of people up to like sort of sensors, okay, and showed us, uh, showed, showed them visual images of things that may be emotionally stimulating or sounds that may have been emotionally stimulating. Dyslexics came out as more receptive to emotional stimuli than non dyslexics. So dyslexics are far more emotionally receptive the non-dyslexics. And by the way, in case you sit there at night crying yourself to sleep over your homework or something, it's also harder for dyslexics to regulate that. So we feel emotions more, but we regulate them slightly harder, slightly less. So this is really interesting. I don't know whether you've ever heard of this. Um, doctors George Land and Beth Jarman were tasked by NASA to produce a test for creative genius and then test children for their creative aptitude. They tested 1,600 preschool children. Now, you may have heard this, you may not. Okay, I'm really interested to know what you think. They tested 1,600 five-year-olds, five-year-olds and below, for creative genius. A little bit like we just did with that little box test. They tested all of these kids, how many of them were creative geniuses? Five years old, any guess, what percentage of these five-year-olds were creative geniuses? 80%. 80%. Brilliant. Anybody else? 90%. Really fascinating. 98% of five-year-olds were creative geniuses. This is a really interesting study because they repeated it five years later. Five years later, at age 10, how many of them were creative geniuses? 40. 30%. Someone said 30%. 30% of them at the age of 10 were creative geniuses. They tested them again at 15 years old. How many of them were creative geniuses? 
12% were creative geniuses. And at this point, they got really depressed and stopped doing it. But another organization did the same, and they tested adults for creative genius. How many of them do you think were creative geniuses in adulthood? They had inverted the creativity ratio of the human race. And by the way, what happens between five years old and adulthood? School. Education happens. This rigid, conformist, remember this, education. By the way, one of the preconditions of creativity is the space to be able to get things wrong. But in school, if you get something wrong, you are punished in some way or another. When I was at school, they'd whip you with a cane, genuinely. I got whipped with a cane for getting my Latin homework wrong. But these days, at the very least, everybody knows you're bottom of the class, and that's an act of, that's a mark of shame. And so for getting things wrong, it's a punishment. Everybody gets punished. So, what are we going to do about this? Well, let's have a look at to do. This is really interesting. So, let's go back to this idea of play. Go back to the idea of play and ask why it's important. I don't know how many of you have studied dyslexia, but one of, the, one of the challenges of being dyslexic is that reading can be a little bit tricky. Okay? I mean, I read all the time. I have to, but it's slow and it's tiring. And some people with dyslexia find it very, very difficult. Some find it very, very difficult indeed. But there's another aspect of dyslexia as well, called working memory. Now, you might know what working memory is. It's essentially the ability to take something, usually through your ears or through your eyes, hold it in your brain, put it over there, and apply it. So here's an example of working memory. Here's an example of working memory. Um, when you have been at school, I don't know when you were at school, but when you've been at school, have your teachers ever asked you to copy something? Yeah. 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 That's putting your stress, that's putting the cognitive stress on working memory. The need to look at something, put it in your brain, look over there, look down at the page, and put it on the page. That's putting the stress on working memory. Nothing to do with learning. It doesn't help you learn a damn thing. What it does is it makes your brain do weightlifting in all the wrong places. So I'm going to give you a task. I'm going to ask you to copy something. You've got a piece of paper, you've got a pen. There will be a prize. There will be a prize for the person who completes this first. Okay? So imagine you're at school. There will be a prize for the person who completes this first. You've got to copy this. Go. Oh. Oh! Oh! Stop! No, you don't have to do that! No, no, yeah. You don't have to do that! But that is essentially what they feel that everyone's going out and nearly finished! I've won the prize! This is essentially what working memory stress feels like. The idea that you've got to take something and it's disappeared by the time you put it over there. Then you go back, you look for it, you can't find it. This is working memory stress. Well, what's really interesting is this is all something to do with what's really important here is dopamine. Okay, dopamine. Now this is really important. Dopamine is one of them chemical things that rushes through your brain, okay? Dopamine is really important for who we are. So let's have a look at dopamine. Dopamine is a chemical in your brain and with experiential and skills-based learning, rather than copying down and remembering stuff, <coughs> the brain releases dopamine. Lots of it. Okay? So when you learn through doing, when you learn through skills, when you learn through experience, your brain releases dopamine. Dopamine increases motivation. Has anyone ever been to school and thought, I can't be bothered? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. Everyone. And one of the reasons is you're not releasing dopamine. You've, you've not got that motivation. There's another reason, by the way, that this, this is a really interesting one. Um, does anyone know Where's Wally? Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone very good at Where's Wally? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Is anybody terrible at Where's Wally? Yeah. Yeah, there's some people terrible. I'm bloody awful at Where's Wally, yeah? And one of the reasons is, the first time I saw it, I couldn't find Wally. Then the second time I saw it, I couldn't find Wally. By the third time, 
I knew I was not the sort of person who could find quality. Now, actually, that's not true. I am just as capable as finding Wally as anybody else. But I experienced something called learned helplessness. Learned helplessness is something that a psychologist called Seligman came up with in 1967 or 1968 to describe that inability to learn because you've been taught that you can't do it. If you're at school and you find that you can't do something, after a couple of attempts, you will know, incorrectly, but you'll believe that you're not able to do it. And you lose motivation. Dopamine also, by the way, helps with spatial learning. Now, those of, with those of us with dyslexia often have problems with spatial learning, spatial awareness. Another thing that dopamine does, by the way, is improves working memory. In other words, where we play, where we play, we increase working memory. Whereas, if we do learning in the traditional format, it puts stresses on working memory in ways which are not helpful for us. So, to give you a quick rundown of this, experiential learning removes the reliance on text-based learning, which many of us with dyslexia find taxing. It releases dopamine, and dopamine improves working memory. In other words, it improves our abilities to learn. And this is nothing new. So I got my PhD in philosophy. One of my favorite philosophers is a guy called John Dewey. John Dewey is one of the greatest philosophers of all time. And he was also a polymath. He knew about loads of stuff. And he did, has anyone been to the library? Yeah. And all those sort of weird sort of A123, that's John Dewey. He gave us that. It's called the Dewey Decimal System. But he was also a philosopher of education. And he said some really interesting things. Give the pupil something to do, not something to learn. And the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Learning naturally results. And by the way, this demanding thinking goes back to the ability to get something wrong. Now, what happens at school is they make school predicated upon certainty, upon knowledge. But actually, no one learns anything when they're certain. You only learn when you think, and you only think when you're uncertain. They need to factor uncertainty into education. Another thing from Dewey, have a look. Education is not preparation for life, education is life itself. So when they give you an education system that doesn't mirror life, that seems to do something weird and different, you've got to wonder what they're doing. And education is not an affair of telling and being told, but an active and constructive process. But does it work? And this is fascinating, I love this. Again, some studies were done. Let me just explain what this means here. The blue is passive learning, essentially sitting there listening to what your teacher says. Listening in lectures. That's what the blue means. And the red is active learning. Essentially doing, playing. When pupils and students were questioned about which they thought helped them most, always they came out, they enjoyed it more, they thought they enjoyed it, they thought they learned a great deal, they thought the instruction was effective, and they wished all their physics courses were like that. But in reality, on the left-hand side, it turns out they learned more by doing. They might have thought they were learning more by listening, but they weren't. So I teach at universities, and we play games all the time. And people sometimes think, what is this guy? Why is he playing games with us? It's because that's how we learn. Through teamwork. Now, this is really important, because it leads to the next aspect, of the four pillars, living together. I'm gonna to show you a couple of cards, okay? I call these calming cards. Beautiful butterfly with a reflection, a lovely uh, giraffe, um, <coughs> got a unicorn, unicorns are always nice, and uh, a chilled out jellyfish. These are what we call calming cards. I'm gonna ask you a question. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Anyone? Fly. Fly, everyone shouts fly, yeah. Fly would be great, wouldn't it? Okay. Right, here we go. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. Yeah. Sit back and watch this video. Mm -hmm. and here's a question. If you could meet one person in the world, who would it be? Ronaldo. Thank you. But you notice that the answers came a little slower. 
What happens when you're put under stress, you're not thinking as clearly. When people are stressed, when they feel in any way sort of crushed by the, by, by the world around them, they don't think as clearly, they don't think as quickly as otherwise. And let me show you these cards. Exactly the same cards, but they look, for about 80% of you by the way, they look a lot less happy. The unicorn looks a little sad, the jellyfish looks a little depressed suddenly. And this is what happens. When you're put under cognitive stress, the world seems darker. When the world seems darker, you don't learn as quickly. And so when your schools are putting the, the, the students under stress, the, the students are not learning. But just to make you feel better, not everything, that has, not everything has to be calming and not everything traumatic has to be bad. However, however, this is really interesting. I love maps. Um, if you visit my website, dyslexiabytes.org, at the bottom there's something called the dyslexia map. I'm putting every dyslexia organization in the world on a Google map. So let me show you a different kind of map. This is fascinating. This is a bullying map. Percentage of students who report being bullied at school at least a few times a month. So in, uh, in Ireland it's 10 to 15 percent. Uh, in Britain it's 20 to 25 percent. And way over there in Russia it's 30 to 35 percent. Um, you may or may not know that if you're dyslexic, in America, the studies show that you are four times as likely to be bullied if you're dyslexic. And in fact, in general, children with learning differences such as dyslexia are generally up to about three times more likely to be bullied, which means that it could be up to 90% of dyslexic children in places like Russia. In places like Britain, you're talking about well, up to 75% of kids with dyslexia are likely to be bullied. And this puts you under stress. It stops you learning. And what does it do? Well, it does this. 80% of dyslexic children. What do you think might stand here? 82% of dyslexic children try to hide their difficulties at school. 52% of dyslexic children try to avoid school. The inability to read shares the same levels of shame as incest. If you're dyslexic, you're twice as likely to become homeless. 50% of those in drug and alcohol rehabilitation are dyslexic. 63% of dyslexics had a criminal conviction by the time they were 24. 85% of dyslexics had attempted self-harm. And the most shocking of them all, there is a 46% raised chance among dyslexics of suicide. Why is this? It's not because you're dyslexic. It's because of what you've been put through your entire life. A life of shame and failure. <coughs> not because it's your fault, but because the school system was designed for a different age. And it was not designed appropriate to people's learning. So we've got to be able to do some things. So what can we do? Well, this is really interesting. I said I'd come back to something called mirror neurons. I don't know if you know what a mirror neuron is or what mirror neurons are. So I'm going to give you a very quick story. Um, my knee doesn't work very well at all. Um, and one of the reasons it doesn't work is I used to fence when I was younger. I was really quite good at fencing. And somebody once put me through some warm-up exercises where we have to stand on guard, jump, spin 360 degrees, and land. And I continued to spin, and that part of the leg didn't, and it tore my cruciate ligament. I would continue to tear it again and again and again. And one day, one day, many years later, I found myself locked in a cemetery. Now, don't ask how, but sometimes you get locked in a cemetery. I found myself locked in a cemetery. The only way out was over the gate. So I climbed up over the gate and I jumped. And as I jumped, I got this foot trapped in the little fleur de lis spikes and I went smash and the leg smashed. Now, one or two of you went, ooh, when I told you that. That's mirror neurons firing, okay? So when I tell you something horrible, you feel it. Has anyone ever been in love? You don't have to answer that. 
I don't think I've ever told anyone they've been in love when it's not really true. Has anybody ever been in love? Because what happens when you're in love with someone, if that person feels sadness, you share that sadness. You don't feel a different sadness, you share that sadness. And it's something that's actually happening in the brain. It's called mirror neurons, and that's what produces empathy. The ability to literally feel what somebody else is feeling. The way to create empathy through mirror neurons is to get to know people. Hence, to be, not a mirror there. The final of the four pillars of education is to be. And this is really important. So we're going to play a game of hangman. Has anyone ever played hangman? Yeah. Of course you played hangman. So, great. Give me a letter. A. 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 Ooh, very good. Same E. Yeah. Sorry? E. E. No E. Uh. F. S. Or. 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 education. From the four pillars of education, 
First of all, we have to realize what the building of knowledge has been in the past. And realize what active knowledge can do, how much better it can be. And finally, not finally, then we need to understand the effects of not doing it. And finally, we need to actualize this by focusing on not what we want to teach, but who we wish to be. And if we can do that, we can create an education system that's fit for everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>